I think we're going to get started, everyone. Good evening. Um, and welcome to our last lecture of 2023. Not the last lecture of the series this year, but last one for this uh, month, none in December. Um, my name is Brian Buchanan, and I'm the president of our local society. And before we get to tonight's speaker, I have a few brief items to go over. And... And one of those is to get the slides working. There we go. Okay, so first of all, whether you are a first time attendee to the AIA or whether you come often, it's always helpful to remind you of who the AIA is and what we do. We are the largest and oldest archeological organization in North America. And our mission is to excavate, educate and advocate for archeology span and cultural heritage all around the world. Our members help us with this mission by supporting archaeologists to conduct research, conduct uh, public education, and to preserve archaeological sites around the world. And as a member, you not only help to support that mission, but you also get a subscription to Archaeology Magazine. So there's my plug for the evening to become a member of the AIA. If you are not already, and if you are, thank you. Our local society here in Spokane, we have a website um, started last spring. We're continuously updating it. Um, one thing I want to bring your attention to, um, if you haven't been on there a little bit, is that we are putting links to other archaeological lecture series are online that are not just through the AIA. So if you cannot get enough archaeology and who can, there are links here for you to go see other lectures. Um, these links here um, are generally free lectures, but sometimes you have to register for it. So please do take a look. We will be trying to update as much as we can um, for public lectures all around the world. As Also keep checking in because we always have information about our speakers as well as other things that our society is doing. And one of those things is if you miss a lecture, a lot of our speakers have graciously allowed us to record our lectures. Um, and we put those onto our own YouTube page um, that you can either go to at that link or there's a link to it on our website. And of course, we are still on Facebook. Um, if you've been getting information about our uh, talks on Facebook, we still update there as well. Now, I, I've talked about this last few meetings, but for those of you who haven't been in a bit, we have um, an electronic newsletter now, thanks to our own Dr. Rachel Horowitz where we email out uh, society happenings and other things happening in the region. Um, we probably will have another one of those coming out um, in the winter or spring. Um, if you've signed up with us in the past, we have your email, you probably have it. Um, you may have it in your spam. So just kind of take a look for, out for it. Um, and we occasionally will have those printed out here at the meetings as well. Um, so uh, keep your eye out for those. And then just to kind of go over a little bit what's happening in the future, as I mentioned, we don't have a December meeting. Um, our next lecture will be Dr. Scott Pike of Willamette University in January. He'll be talking about the, um, the Neolithic site of the Nessa Braca in the Orkney Islands. Um, in February, we have Dr. Benarucci from the University of Arkansas talking about shopping for status in Roman shops. And in March, we have Dr. Tekla Schmaus of Washington State University talking about um, tropes about nomadic archeology. span And we have a TBC to be determined for April. We will let you know in the future as we go with that. 
Um, before we go any further, um, we here at the AIA, we want to um, acknowledge that we would like to honor the original people of the lands on which we stand by recognizing this as the traditional homeland territory of the Spokane tribe. Their presence here since time immemorial can be seen and felt within these museum walls and in the surrounding landscapes. With gratitude, we would like to extend a thank you to the Spokane's past, present, and future for sharing this space as a place for artistic and cultural expressions to be enjoyed by all. Not to interrupt or be rude, but uh, I teach you up for land tribe. Okay. Also, our Aboriginal territory that we're on here. Thank you very much. I want to add that to the language. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we'll do. We, we've, we've adopted that from the museum's uh, land acknowledgement. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, the following is a live presentation and viewer recording is strictly prohibited. Um, the AIA respects the intellectual property of its presenters and asks that viewers do the same. And thank you for your cooperation. Um, so tonight's lecture is in honor of James and Jenny Russell. Um, this uh, lecture series was sponsored by the Archaeological Institute of America in their name. Um, James Russell is a professor emeritus of Greek and Roman art and archaeology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And Russell served as the president of the AIA from 1992 to 94, um, was the first president from outside the U.S. to actually hold that post since the organization's founding in 1879. Um, in addition to all of his work as a classical archaeologist, including at the Roman site of Anna Murum, he has uh, taught and researched across um, <clears throat> Roman and early Byzantine art and archaeology. And this lecture um, is sponsored for any topic of archaeological interest. So thank you very much to the AIA. All right, enough of my housekeeping. I want to introduce tonight's speaker, which my apologies, this, this slide got washed out, but um, Dr. Davis's rest of his talk is not. Um, so we're going to introduce Dr. Lauren Davis um, from or the Department of Anthropology at Oregon State University. Um, Dr. Davis obtained his PhD in anthropology from the University of Alberta. His master's in anthropology, geography, and soil science. Is that correct? Soil science? Right on. From Oregon State University in 1995 and his undergraduate degree in anthropology from the same university in 1991. His research focuses primarily on questions related to the Pleistocene archaeology of the Americas, particularly focused on Western North America. He is the executive director of the Keystone Archaeological Research Fund, which is designed to support sustained efforts to find and study Pleistocene aged archaeological evidence in Western North America. He's widely published on the period, and tonight we'll be discussing how discoveries at Cooper's Ferry increases our knowledge of early Pacific Northwest peoples. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lauren Davis. Well, thank you very much. Um, it's a very nice introduction, and I'm very thankful to be here this evening and share some of the work that I have done. Uh, and I have to say, just to start, <clears throat> the work that I do as an archaeologist is a very privileged thing in the sense that I'm talking about the deep heritage of other people. And so I am not a tribal person, but the work that I do is done in collaboration with uh, the Bureau of Land Management, but also, most importantly, it's done in collaboration with the Nez Perce tribe. And so uh, we'll talk about some of the themes tonight about how archaeology informs sort of our understanding of a people in a place over an extremely long period of time. And I think that uh, in my own work, I, I actually gave a lecture here in 2015. I looked this up. And uh, at that time, we were still learning a lot about the things that we will talk about tonight. So this isn't just a retread of the 2015 paper. We learned a tremendously um, number of more important things about the site itself. But in my own work, I feel like I've also been working toward a version of doing archaeology where I can do things that are of more relevance, perhaps, to the people that this story is about. So, which is a harder thing to do in archaeology. It's easy just to talk about things and sort of forget that the things represent people. The ideas of people and the things that people can put into motion and and they, they talk about their own history and the peoples themselves 
And so these are things that I've learned and I've been fortunate to work more recently, much more closely with people with the this person that have helped me understand these things better. So I will always be a student, you know, in the work that I do. And uh, I think all of you too, in this room too, you understand that it's a lifelong learning thing about archeology. span Okay, that's a big introduction, but we'll get started. So, um, okay, so let's jump to 16,000 years ago. So this is a reconstruction of how we think our region may have looked about 16,000 years ago. And so here I put Spokane on the map. Spokane, as I'm sure everyone who lives around here understands, it would have been underneath a lot of water at certain times in the past as mega floods emptied uh, what was Glacial Lake Missoula uh, catastrophically across the region. So the blue polygon area is all the Missoula flood and all the, these pro-glacial lakes you know, having ice the size of Canada on North America was a little inconvenient for local hydrology in the sense that it made rivers not want to not be able to go the ways they wanted to. So they did other things. They made lakes. And you know, it's a huge kind of reorganization of how the world appears at this time. And we're going to talk about the site that in the archaeological literature is called Cooper's Ferry, but we'll talk about too the Nez Perce perspective on this a little bit. But Cooper's Ferry is located up the Salmon River Basin, which is a tributary of the Snake. So animal rivers get confusing. So, but Salmon is a very different river canyon than the Snake River Canyon. Probably many of you have seen this. But Cooper's Ferry is higher in elevation than the mega flood pools. So we don't see the effect of the geology of this in that part of Western Idaho, which might explain some of the reasons why we see some of the record that we do also in the canyon, because at 16,000, the areas that are in the course of the Missoula floods would have been absolutely devastated in terms of a geological effect on anything in its path. And so it could be that just because you don't find an archaeological site that dates to, let's say, 16,000 in an area like here doesn't mean that people weren't around. It's just that archaeology has limitations to what you can actually measure about the past. And some of that is controlled by things like geological events. So, so it's easy to make a mistake of saying, well, there's no evidence. That must be the answer. But no, sometimes the answer is there's just no evidence. Doesn't mean that you have the answer exactly. Okay. Also, to make ice the size of Canada... Uh, that water budget comes out of the world's oceans. So Oregon and Washington had extra coast at that time. And where I work uh, in, in Oregon, uh, Central Oregon, for example, the coast had about 35 extra miles of coastline to the west, which is a pretty amazing thing to think about. And in my own work, I've been doing research with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And this is a branch of federal government you've probably never even heard of. But it controls the second largest income stream to the U.S. Treasury, and that's because of its way that it regulates oil and gas and renewable energy offshore. And so that part of the U.S. government that's concerned about these parts of our what's called exclusive economic zone, the, the submerged offshore areas adjacent to the United States, those also include landscapes, as we're showing here, that had an indigenous history. And so I've helped to work with the federal government to get them to understand and also to be able to build capacity to predict where sites might be, where people may have wanted to be in the landscape, and then how to find those things. So all this stuff kind of wraps together in certain ways, but I think it's fascinating to think about how our region may have looked in the past. And so this was a world unlike now, obviously. You had a mountain of ice to the north. We had mega floods. We had a whole menagerie of animals that are now gone that were here running around the landscape. And we'll talk about some of them as we go forward here too. Okay, so here's a view into the lower Salmon River Canyon. Um, it's a pretty dry and warm place, at least temper uh, seasonally. And we talk about the Cooper's Ferry site, but the Nez Perce people, the Nimipu, refer to this place as a location of an ancient village. So in their oral history, there's a very specific story about this place and it has a name, Napaha is the name, and it also relates to an event where people were there and orphan children appeared uh, at, at the village and were taken in. So it has a story about this event within the sort of refer to the place in reference to the children. 
So um, when I go and talk to, you know, people at the cultural program in this first tribe, you know, they're not, we, we share information with them as we work. Uh, and, you know, often it's interesting to be able to share details about things. And they're like, well, sure. Like there's all kinds of stories about the things that you're talking about. And that for me is one of the more rewarding things is to see how archaeological science and traditional perspectives go together. And they often weave together in ways that are pretty interesting and amazing. And there's also, I think what's amazing is the stories that you'll hear that we don't seem to have any measures for archeologically, but that doesn't might just mean we just haven't found it yet. So, so I think that kind of stuff's pretty special. So, so here's the view. So the site is located at this tributary canyon coming into the main part of the Salmon River. And these tributaries are pretty special. They're set up roughly about every 20 miles along the length of the river and they're largely controlled by fault systems. And so it's no surprise perhaps that the site is situated at this junction. It's a major off-ramp, so to speak, out of the canyon. You can access different ecologies from this area. And also too, it's a place where because of the influence of the, the stream coming in and pushing gravel into the river, it provides a natural place for driftwood to accumulate. And so elders have you know, pointed out basic things like, well, this is a great place to live because the lumber yard comes to you, you know, and the firewood comes to you. So this is a great place to be. Uh, so there's a lot of practical things too for why people would situate themselves sometimes. But, you know, there could have been many other places in the canyon that are harder for us to measure because one thing that's special about the Cooper's Ferry site is that it has been accumulating sediment over a long period of time. And so for an archaeological record to build up, you also need to ideally have a place where the sediments accumulate. And so you have both things. You have the people pursuing their own lives in a place, but then the geology captures the things that get left behind in a way that allow us to understand the record. And so I first started to work at the Cooper's Ferry site in 1997. I was a graduate student at the University of Alberta, and I had been working for the Bureau of Land Management in Cottonwood, Idaho for several summers. And I got to know the geology and the archeology span of the region. I was very fascinated with this earliest time period because it seemed very challenging part to figure out. And an archeologist had worked here in the sixties named B. Robert Butler. And he revealed that the site had these different layers in it, but we didn't understand the ages of them because it was not possible to get radiocarbon ages on very, very small items in the 1960s and 70s. Just te that technique developed later. And then also uh, in 1997, I did this, I directed the excavation of this two meter by two meter pit, which is about the size of an elevator shaft in sort of dimensions. So it's an extremely small window into the ground. But what we were able to show is that there is a long record of people returning to the site, doing activities, leaving things behind, and these different kinds of sediment layers that you see will bury them. And so this gave us you know, hope that there's a, you know, a record here that we could actually uh, tap into to understand more about the record. Now, so in starting this work in, in 1997, it just gave us, gave us a very small glimpse into what the site might hold. And so for example, I apologize for the very small photographs for the audience here, but um, in those photographs, it's the end of a 10 centimeter level. So every time we excavate a level, we go in this site, at least we excavate about 10 centimeters at a time. We map everything we can that we find. And at the end of 10 centimeters, we take a photograph. And so what I can do is flip through the photographs and reconstruct at least like a you know, strobe light view sort of of how we excavated it. But what's important here is we were in the bottom of the site. And let me just jump back. This lower level down here, this tan sediment is windblown glacial dust. And that's yeah, familiar to this part of the world, right? So the Palouse, for example, is loads of dust that comes from mega floods. But a lot of that stuff originates as, you know, glacial ground, you know, bedrock. And... <clears throat> The earliest components of the site are in this windblown glacial dust. So in this photograph, we're down here in the bottom of the dust, windblown glacial dust area, and we started to find rocks, larger rocks coming in this windblown glacial dust, which doesn't make sense geologically. And as we excavated down, we realized that it actually was a pile of gravel. Underneath the pile of gravel, 
we found a dark circle of sediment. And underneath that, we kept going. There was gravel that underlaid everything at the site, but the circle kept on going into the gravel. And so what you're seeing here is like the sliced deconstruction of a pit. So imagine if you had to dig a pit in the ground, this is what it would look like if it got buried. Inside the pit, we found uh, items left behind by the people that lived here about 13,200 years ago. So we got radiocarbon dates on items inside the pit and also from the surface where the top of the pit was at. And some of the items include these things. So we have stemmed projectile points at the top, and there's also um, probably other parts of a toolkit that are designed to make and replace things like projectile points, or you could make knives or scraping tools. So someone basically put their own toolkit in the ground and left it there, and it didn't get just uncovered again until 13,200 years later when we were there. So, so this started sort of the whole thing in 1997. And at that time, the predominant idea was that anything close to 13,000 years shouldn't look like this. It should look like another kind of tool that archeologists call Clovis projectile points, which you may have heard about before. We're not gonna talk about Clovis so much, um, but just suffice to say that the ideas that we see represented in these kinds of tools represent sort of a different concept of how to take rocks apart and end up at hunting technology. And that is traditional knowledge that's sort of um, put into a material form. That is, archeologists get very excited about finding things like projectile points, but in the end, it's not about the projectile point. It's that that thing represents a snapshot of traditional knowledge that someone taught someone else how to do this and it got replicated over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And that's a pretty powerful idea to think about the continuity of tradition as, as represented in the archeological record. And that'll be a theme that we'll keep talking about. Okay, so in 2004, I got a job at Oregon State University and I started a conversation with my colleague at the Bureau of Land Management in Idaho. And I said, you know, there was, Pretty amazing things that came out of that one two meter by two meter hole that we dug in 1997. It would be excellent to learn more about this. And so my colleague, David Sisson, who's an archeologist for the Bureau of Land Management in Cottonwood, Idaho, started a conversation with an Esperse Tribal Council and their culture program. And it took a while to get everyone to come to a consensus that essentially doing more work at Cooper's Ferry and the Paha would be a good idea. And a good idea in the sense that the tribe felt they would learn things from more work uh, being practiced here. And uh, also it was an opportunity for tribal youth to come and work with us on occasions uh, to learn more about uh, archeology span and their own heritage in a firsthand kind of way. And so the idea was that if we could learn more about this, what we think was gonna be an early record we could help educate others about what early heritage of as per people might look like, how to identify it, how do I maybe avoid it if you can, to not have to destroy it, and things like this. So, uh, okay, so from 2009 to 2018, we ran a series of 10 field schools in 10 summers. So 10 years in a row, we did this. And if you wanna learn more about that whole project, you can go to YouTube and just search for Cooper's Ferry site. And there are over a hundred videos that we have in there that we made over the time we did this. And many of them are very short They're and they're really basic. Some of them are like, how do we excavate? You know, what are stone tools? And what does this mean in terms of when we do this work together? So, um, and it's, it's mostly intended to be an outreach and education piece. Okay, so we excavated at area A, and area B. And if you know where to look on Google Earth, you can find this image. So one summer, a little plane flew over and took a photograph of us working. And this is now, you know, on Google Earth forever. And so, um, so area A is, is the part closest to where we started in 97. And then later on, we opened again in the area where B. Robert Butler worked in the 60s. We worked in area B. And so, okay. So this is what it'll look like underneath that shade tarp that we had made. And it's very hot here. And I mean that in a serious way from like a earth human way, like it's 120 degrees in the canyon in the summertime. And it's super hot if you've never been there in August 
or in July. And to make a shade shelter like this is just practical. You can help control light a little bit. And also it does make it a little cooler. We had a thermometer under the shade in one day, it was 114 in the shade. So that that's something, you know, it's cooler than 120. But um, anyway, so we do large block excavations. And the reason why we wanted to do it this way is that we wanted to understand the lives of the people who lived here at the scale of their lives in the sense that we didn't want to put a bunch of little tiny holes around and then try to guess as to what exactly was happening. I mean, imagine going to your own house and putting a one meter by one meter hole in one part of your house and then another one, another part of your house, and then have somebody tell the story of your life. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty difficult to do, right? Nor is it very practical. So we tried to do better by opening up a larger area. And then also the work took 10 years because we tried to map everything we could about the size of a dime and bigger in the ground. And I'll show you some reconstructions later about why that stuff matters. So we took our responsibility of working at the site very, very, very seriously because, you know, excavation is destructive. So we wanted to make the most out of our effort and be able to give the most back, you know, to everyone involved. So as we excavated, not only did we want to know where the objects were and what they were like, and we mapped them all very carefully, as I mentioned, we use laser transits. Um, there's a horizontal pole that you can see in this picture that has a GoPro camera that's taking a photograph every 10 seconds. So we can actually run the whole excavation as a time-lapse movie for years and years. Uh, so the, all these things we tried to do to record stuff. So as we worked, we also began to realize that this site wasn't just a place where people, you know, made stone tools and maybe butchered animals, which of course was wouldn't be a thing, wouldn't be a reason to want to excavate a site, you know, because we know people do this through time. But what we were able to see is that people did some rather, some other kinds of activities that left behind more complex things. Like what you're looking at here is the inside of a pit. And so we find a lot of what are called features. So you can kind of see this perhaps, um, here's a line that has the outline of the pit. And inside it's a different color compared to other things around it. And some, and we found quite a few of these at the site and they sometimes contain things like I showed you before, the you know, assemblage of tools. Other times they have other kinds of things which we'll talk about. So this one in particular dates to about 9,500 years ago. So when I say Cal BP, that's just a nerdy way of sort of saying years ago. So, so we'll think of it that way. So when we talk about um, other kinds of features, we have very, very you know obvious kinds of things like this. We, this is feature 10, but it's, it's essentially what a campfire or what we would call campfire, but a fire hearth would look like um, if you were to excavate it. So the top of it in, on the left is a lot of ashy sediment with a lot of burned um, pieces, small pieces of bone, but also lots and lots of burned pieces of rock. We would call these fire cracked rock. And when you remove the top of this, uh, we found a surface underneath it that had been subjected to high heat, which we think is why it's all orange and oxidized. So you probably have seen this at the beach. If you scrape away charcoal, you'll see the sand is turned an orange color because that's just the chemical reaction of heat and you'll rust or oxidize that sediment. So, so we can measure the presence of people doing things at the site, not just from the objects, but also from more complex things you can't just pick up and, and take away. You know, they're, they're too complex and they're fragile. So a fire hearth has to be deconstructed to understand it. Then this one is one that was 10,000 years ago. Okay, so the earliest part of the record exists in this these lower sediments. And we're gonna talk about this for the pretty much the rest of this next section. So this down here is a buried soil. And what we mean by a soil is that it's a part of the site that didn't receive a lot of erosion or didn't receive a lot of new addition of sediment. The ground was rather stable for a while, stable enough that you have a bunch of additions of things like organic matter being added, so probably plants, little insects and animals living in the top, but also you get sort of uh, chemical weathering. So in this case, the ground is has a lot of calcium carbonate. So it's a white and crusty mineral that accumulates under dry conditions. So this 
buried soil. We call this the Rock Creek soil, named after the nearby creek. And this is the part that contains a very early record that we're going to talk about. So this diagram on the in the middle here is just sort of a cartoon representation of the whole thing. But this is layer three. And layer three is that windblown glacial dust with the Rock Creek soil. So we talked about the discovery of these four spear points or stemmed points out of this pit that dates to 13,200. As we kept going deeper, we found other things. We found other, um, ev other evidence of repeated human occupation, meaning as people were coming back to the site, they were leaving things behind and these sediments would accumulate. And then eventually, as I talked about later, the soil would develop. But these things would get buried as um, people would leave them behind. More windblown dust would come in and bury them, which is why we can get a stack sequence of things like other fire hearths or other pits or other stone tool materials um, in this lower sediment. Now, the text is very small, but uh, what we realized was that the record that we found in 1997 of 13,200 we were amazed at that time period, but that we were just getting started. And so as we excavated into this part, we realized that there were earlier occupations that went back to 13,400, 13,600. And then as we went deeper, we found a fire hearth uh, down here that had radiocarbon ages that got um, close to 15,000 years. So below this, we start to run out of these features but we still have stones tool material that takes us into dates that get us closer between 15 to 16,000 years. Now this was controversial when we published this first in 2019. You know, critics are gonna criticize. That's what they do often. And they always want sometimes more than you can deliver. But some people were not satisfied with the evidence. They said, well, if people were really here, we would expect to find more features. And why aren't you finding more of these kind of projectile points down deeper, you know, why don't you find more? Like more, more, more. The uh, people are just in their, their hunger for this is just unending sometimes for criticism. But anyway, so what we did find though is that the argument we make is that the items that are left behind here, and these are include the flakes from the production of stone tools. We find pieces of animal bone that are fragmented. We find pieces of charcoal down here. And we think that that is just simply the items that get left behind from people living at the site. Now, wherever they're making their, you know, fire hearth or other pit features, it just wasn't right here where we excavated. It was someplace else probably on the lands form, the landscape, but we just didn't see it right here. Well, um, so we make the argument that people are here, and this is in 2019, from 16,000 years and later. Now, what I should also say is that isn't some statement about the earliest number or something like that. That's just simply a statement of that's as early as we can measure it here. Because if you notice, the sediments that have the archaeology in it stop, you turn to gray sand, and then it turns to gravel. So we ran out of dirt in the sense of, I can't tell you if people are here 20 or 23,000 or something at this site, because we don't have the ability to measure it. That is, the record doesn't just keep on going forever. It stops sometimes at a certain time period. So if we want to answer that question, we'd have to go find another site somewhere else that has the dirt of the right age. That is, it has to have the sediments that date to the time period earlier than, let's say, 16,000. So, so don't forget. Okay. All right, let's, let's move on. So we also found this. So in this shallow pit down here, dating to about 14,500 years, we found evidence of a horse. And now this was an extinct horse. This was a different kind of horse than today, but this was amazing to share this, of course, with people from the Nespers tribe to talk about how horses have come in, you know, come in and out of their lives over long periods of time. And that was, this is a big interest to people. And so this is the piece we found on the left we found that piece. Now we had also found some larger pieces of bone, but they were sort of degraded. So it was hard to interpret what animal they were. These larger chunks of bone, they could be almost anything just by looking at them. Now there are some other techniques we can use where we can take very, very small amount, like about the size of a grain of sand and you can subject it to a laboratory analysis and they'll tell you it's likely a horse or it might be an elephant or something 
um, based on its its protein structure. And that's not the same as DNA, but it's it's a different technique. So we're in discussions now to try to do more of that, to learn more about what those bone fragments might be. But suffice to say that we found this, and this is very, very obvious evidence of a horse. In fact, at first I was very confused when I saw this because I we have not ever found um, animal remains of extinct animals in archaeological sites in the Salmon River Canyon. Um, and so first we were, you know, when I saw it in the field, and I'm, you know, and animal remains are not my strong suit. So I was scratching my head like, is this an elk? Is this, you know, some really strange, you know, deep roots of a mountain sheep? I don't know. But it was way too big. So I had some experts look at this. And these are people that that's what they do. They're ancient horse paleontologists. And they came back and said, yeah, that's a horse. So, so given its position in the site, it's dates to about this time period. Now, if you've ever been to the Hagerman horse um, locality, this fossil bed in southern Idaho, fantastic long record of horses in, you know, in the northwest. But those animals are much, much, much older than these. But horses did persist in uh, North America. Um, I think the early, the oldest, or the youngest ones, sorry, they disappear not long after this. And so I think by the time you get to about 13,000 years ago, they're all all but just about disappeared everywhere. So, okay. So as we were excavating here and we published our paper in Science Magazine in 2019 about the excavation, and we make the argument that people are here at the site from 16,000 years ago and after, we were also excavating an area B. So that paper that we wrote in Science was just about this. And so when the critics were saying, we want to see more things, here's our laundry list of requests of other things we would like to see. Fortunately, we were also excavating over here, and we were able to actually answer some of the things that the critics were talking about in Area B. So, so from 2012 to 2018, we opened up another large area here, and this area is a little deeper than, than Area A, so we have to keep it open um, so that we don't have dangerous walls next to us as we're working. But um, this diagram just simply shows, as students were excavating here, there these students are actually working on a number of features together. So here you can see the rounded top of a pit. Over here, Sarah is working on a bunch of rocks coming out of the top of what will be another pit feature, and another one is appearing over here. So lots of different pit features over in Area B compared to Area A. And uh, I'll zoom in on this so you can see it a little better. But these pit features over here are dating, at least initially we were finding them dating to um, between 11 and 12,000 years um, over here. And so as we would excavate one of these pits, like this one, we call this feature 110, and we have over a hundred of these different kinds of features at the site that really give us a rich understanding of what people are doing. These dots are correspond to this key, but essentially what they are is all the items that we found in place while we excavated the pit, we mapped them all in place. And so there's a whole bunch of things. And the majority of these are the chips of stone tool material from the production of stone tools or devotage, we call it. We also find a lot of unidentified animal bone through here. Um, and then we also find some other things, some form tools. And some of the animal bone though was identifiable based on its appearance. And so this pit feature returned radiocarbon ages in the you know, 11,200 to 11,300 range, years ago range. So as we were excavating, we, we started to see a pattern that was reminiscent of things we had saw in 1997. The pit features uh, would often produce stemmed points. So as we excavated, we find that people were putting stem points in the ground and burying them. In fact, this pit produced all of these together. And sometimes we would even find the broken base of it. And then you dig a little farther and you would find the rest of it and it would refit back together. And um, we also found a piece of Wolverine mandible in this pit feature that dates to this time period. And that to me was pretty amazing, like Wolverine. I don't really think of Wolverine in our environment, but I had a lot to learn. Um, and as we excavated a little more, we found this. This is the mandible of a canid. And now if 
Canid just simply means it's an animal that's a dog, a wolf, a coyote, or a fox, but we're not sure which one. But we, this diagram at the bottom is just to remind me that we did measurements on the geometry of the teeth and their relationship to each other. And uh, it suggests that this canid is smaller than a wolf and bigger than a coyote. And it falls in line with other early dogs that have been found in the Americas at other sites. And so the earliest evidence of dogs in the Americas comes from Vancouver Island right now. There's a canine tooth that came out of a site in the northern part, and it's about 13,000 years old. And so um, we sent off one of the teeth out of this to a laboratory for them to try to get DNA out of it so we could get a more definitive answer, but the preservation was not good, so they couldn't tell us based on DNA. But the geometry of these things, I think, gives me confidence that we're probably looking at a dog. We're probably looking at someone's domesticated animal. And so this was a great story too, to bring up with, with Ness Perselders and talking about this. And that opens up all kinds of stories that I, I won't tell here, but, but necessarily not a surprise. Like, yes, dogs have been with us a very, very long time. You know, we're not surprised that archeologists can measure them. Uh, and with just to go back at 11,350 years here at the site. And so, that's pretty amazing. Now, what I also would like to point out is this wasn't like we found just a piece of a tooth. Someone purposefully fractured the mandible at the base of the what's called the ascending ram ramus. So they fractured it at the very back of the teeth and then put it in the ground. And we didn't find out, well, that's not true. In, in the distance here, you can barely see it, is a part of the back of the skull of another dog. It's a smaller one though, and it's burned. And so it starts to get us to ask questions about, well, what is the nature of this? Why would someone just put a mandible? And I have to admit, I don't have all the answers to all these things, but I think what we end up looking at is we're looking at behaviors about um, special treatment of items, including animals. And when we say special treatment, I'm using it in a very vague way because I don't always understand the. And these are the beginnings of conversations that I'm starting to have now with Nez Perce peoples, but there's a lot of really neat things I think that we're going to be able to talk about in terms of the way that people and animals coexist in a place and how they should be treated even uh, into death. Okay, so moving on, we found another pit feature, of course, in Area B that we call pit feature 01, but in this one, we did the same kind of thing. We found a lot of different Items, we mapped them in place. We then also found a stem point in this one. And at the very bottom of this pit, we found some other bone at the very, very bottom where it terminates on top of the gravel. Some other bone down here, and it was very fragmentary. So I'm. we had 3D scans made of the different pieces, and then we assembled it digitally. And then I um, had it printed. And I could so I could walk the reconstructed mandible across campus and go to the fisheries and wildlife programs comparative collection because they have this big room full of animal skeletons. And so we just started pull, opening drawers and making comparisons. And you know, at first I thought, oh, maybe it's like a coyote or maybe it's a small wolf or something. Well, it turns out it is wolverine again. So so two wolverines in two different pits. Um, and what's amazing about this one, too, is it's in this similar kind of time period, you know, close to 11,000 years ago. Um, now, Wolverine, I didn't realize this until I started this project, but Wolverine is actually quite close to Cooper's Ferry. In fact, Idaho Fish and Game maps that there's winter range for Wolverines within a day's walk. So half a day out and half a day back. You can go from Cooper's Ferry up into Wolverine country in the winter time um, and come back. And so uh, right here is the site and then uh, all the areas um, that are in this sort of yellow to, to brown zone of, up in here are these mid elevations The Wolverine hangs out in the winter. In the summer, Wolverine goes much, much higher in elevation. So what's important about this is that it's an indicator, I think for the seasonality perhaps of when this, this animal was probably obtained. It would be pretty hard to get a wolverine in the summer from Cooper's Ferry. You could do it. It would just be an extremely long walk 
to go try to do it. So it makes maybe logically more sense that this is a wintertime activity. All right, so as we were excavating in area B through the years, we've got deeper and deeper and deeper. And as we got deeper, we just kept finding more of the similar patterns of things we had seen before. And so um, in this diagram here, I'm showing you is a plan view that is a sort of a looking downward, like you're in a helicopter looking down. But this is the, um, and from here to here is a meter in, in scale, a meter by a meter. So this is a pit feature. Here's another pit feature. Here's another one. Here's the items that we had mapped inside. So that's just showing you through the entire depth from above. And on the right-hand side, you can see what one of these looks like when we're excavating them. So they're pretty obvious, even just the sediments. But then when you map all the items, it's like, well, the pits contain almost all the items in the bottom, which I think is part of the explanation for in area A, why we found so little in this lower, lower part that was earlier well, it could be that people are putting items in things like pits away from maybe where they're living. And I don't have all the explanations for why that's happening. I'm just describing the patterns here. So what we found, though, inside these pit features was pretty interesting. We found more stemmed points accumulated together. And so people had made three different pits they put in there things like the chips from the production of stone tools, fragments of bone, uh, pieces of rock that had been burned in a fire, firecracked rock, we call it, and also things like this, weapons. And um, the weapons are in various states. So some of them are totally fine. Like you could rearm some of these and use them again. Some of them look like they've, they've you know, had a misadventure, as we might call it. So... But most of them are in pretty good shape. Um, I have this one on the far right is amazing too. It fits on your thumbnail. Okay, and pay attention also to the radiocarbon ages that came out of those pits. So these were seven radiocarbon ages on animal bone that return ages of 16,675 to 15,240. Now that's the age range, but the average is closer to 16,000. So sometimes that's how we talk about it. So, um, so this pattern of making pits, making these same kinds of technological weapon systems, doing the same practice of whatever this represents to the people that are doing this, the same practice of putting things in the ground um, is something that at the Cooper's Ferry site, we can measure this from a, before 16,000 years to about 9,000 years ago. So it's something that people are doing over and over and over and over again. So in terms of traditions, and ideas being passed around, it's pretty amazing. Um, okay, so the very bottom of area B shows us a similar kind of pattern to what we saw in area A, meaning it answered what the critics wanted. They wanted more features, they wanted more tools, like projectile points, and they wanted more dates. And so we delivered, fortunately. I mean, it is what it is. It wasn't like I made it happen. So um, I'm just reporting what we found. So, um, okay, so let's talk about then, when we say the archeological evidence for the Napaha Winter Village, this is not a statement I'm making like, well, we got to test to see if that idea is correct. I don't think that's appropriate. That's not the right idea. It's just that when people talk about things, the lives of people are so much more rich than the archeological record that gets left behind. So that is the things that get preserved and represent the past are such a small window of what gets preserved, what's actually left behind. So all archaeologists, all of you in the room here, understand this part. It's not a one-to-one. -one. Even if you go to a place like Pompeii, I was hearing about, it's still not a snapshot and people frozen in time doing exactly what they were doing. It's still a, it's a really good version of what it was like, but it's not a perfect representation. So, so, but, so then how can we measure this idea that there was a village here from the evidence that we have? So that's my, my task here. Well, I have some expectations in our, as an archeologist. So what I would think a village with a capital V, what that would look like. I think we would find evidence of very intensive activity. Two areas that we excavated and that, that volume of removed sediment, we mapped and also recorded in the screens over 500,000 items. And most of that is actually the chips from the production of stone tools. 
and small fragments of animal bone. So if you've ever made stone tools yourself, you know you can make a big mess pretty fast. So you should take do that sometime and then count them and see how many you can make in 15 minutes. You might impress yourself how many you can make. So, but a lot of items left behind. And we also find complex things like fe features, pits where people are putting things in the ground and also processing features like these hearths and with, that are full of fire tracked rock and bone. And most of the bone, as I mentioned, is very small fragmentary pieces. My suspicion is that people were probably processing the bone to extract fat because and I will speak only for myself, as a representative of, of American society, I have conquered the problem of where to get fat in my diet. <laughs> so I figured out where that stuff's at. But in the past, that's that's harder to do. It's much, much harder to do. Fat is a resource that is actually quite, it's quite precious in the sense that, you know, if you've ever done any big game hunting, it's not like they're Wagyu beef walking around the landscape. They're pretty lean animals most of the time. Sometimes they do have a lot of fat on them, but fat is a commodity that's hard to get. So we think that the process in the bone reflects that. Um, we've also find things like equipment storage. So you start to see some logistical things that people were doing because they're anticipating either doing activities here again in the future or they're staging things at this place. So we have over a hundred projectile points from Cooper's Ferry. Many of them are found inside pits. And we think we can also think about the pits as lockers, like sort of storage lockers. So people are putting things in the ground. It's like, well, when we come back here next season or whenever we come back again, we're probably gonna hunt again. So rocks are heavy. Why haul everything around the landscape? We'll just store it here. So we, we would expect to see those kinds of facility sort of maintenance things at, at the site. We also would expect to find winter range animals during a winter village, a winter occupation. And I should also maybe step back and just say briefly that um, the Nez Perce have, of course, very specific words for very specific things, including the concept, the theoretical concept of the winter village. The winter village being the way in which you can figure out that you have to accumulate some resources in other times of the year to make it through the winter. That is, you, there's a seasonal schedule of resources that have to be acquired and processed and stored correctly to live in this place correctly. And people could do this, as far as we can tell, from at least 16,000 years ago. So, so the winter village concept is one in which you are basically amassing a whole bunch of resources for delayed use. So uh, bulk resource acquisition for delayed consumption. That's what we would say like a Costco concept, right? So anyway, get a whole bunch of food and you can eat it later when you're sitting in your in your village. So, but the thing that we're missing that I haven't talked about that I would expect to see are houses. Now, again, the absence of evidence in archeology span is not evidence of absence. So, so we just can't think about um, that we haven't measured the house maybe at a certain time as there's no houses. I find it impossible to imagine that people could live in this place without a house. I mean, yeah, but I think that's just a given. And it doesn't matter to me if people want to argue, well, yeah, where are they? Well, I'll, maybe I can change your mind here in just a few minutes. So we have some evidence that I think may actually answer this question. So if we think about the measure of houses in the archeological record in our region, we can look at sites that were excavated in the lower Snake River system, for example, during the the dam production times, when they're construction times. So this is a site named uh, Wishpushname, and Wishpushname has a lot of late period, as we would call it in archaeology, uh, sites that are not very deeply buried. So you can see Washington State University archaeologists are working to expose all the items that they can find in the ground, and they're going to leave them there all in and map them. But they want to take photographs to kind of represent the proof of what the house looked like. So here it is sort of obliquely, and then here it is more from above. But obviously you can see here that they not only have items, but the margins of this are also within a slight depression. And so traditionally, we know this from contact and also from traditional knowledge that you know regional tribal folks have about how to make houses. Semi-subterranean houses are not uncommon. It's a, it's a version of a house that can be made and activities that take place in the house can be left behind. So this is, for me at least, 
I'm not going to ever excavate a house standing as perfectly as it is. You know, we're not going to find a house like that. We're going to find something like this. This is probably going to reflect something closest we can measure to a house. Now, from a stratigraphy point of view, that is the layers in a site, we also can think about houses as being a three-dimensional object. If you're going to make a depression in the ground, then it will cross-cut through the stratigraphy like this. And so above that line is the inside of the house, and below it was the, the ground that got sort of altered. And sometimes you might even find architectural features like this. So at which Pushnamay, they found actual burn posts and beams, architectural features that went along with houses inside them. Houses can catch on fire and they can burn. And when they do that, sometimes they leave behind this kind of record. All right. So moving back then to the bottom of this brown layer, we call this layer, layer six. As we excavated the site, um, we're coming down, down, down on top of these boundaries that we can see between the different colored sediments. So the brown sediment overlies the gray sediment. So as I tell the students when they're digging, just take the brown dirt off of the gray dirt. Don't go into the... Just curious to see what it looks like. So as they would do that, um, they would find some things. But before we talk about that part, I'm getting a little out of sequence. We have expectations about the layering too. That is, we have different layers that exist at the site. And I talked about the windblown glacial dust, but above that should be a gray sand, and above that should be the brown, and so on. So as we work through most of the site, this was the layered sequence we would see. But what we're going to do now is rotate our view in this photograph and look to see what's behind us. And behind us, this wall continues with this gray layer and the brown layer. But you notice as we go around the corner, it breaks down. And so here, the brown layer is cross-cutting this one. And it's intruding in. And we also have a couple of weird things. These polka dots are the infilled tunnels of rodents. So rodent burrows, which are the arch enemy of the archaeologist. For sure, because they move stuff around and mess up the record. But we sometimes will see things like this, these vertical guys. These vertical guys are really quite different. They're not, we don't think these are rodent burrows. Rodent burrows don't really, rodents don't really make burrows in a way that it has like a Santa Claus escape accent. They're not going up through chimneys. They want to go on more like ramped tunnels and so on. Anyway, um, I'll show you another example of these. So these were awfully strange. And it was also doubly strange that they would go along with this sort of stratigraphic disturbance. So one interpretation of what we're looking at right here is that we're actually looking at a house feature that was cut down into this. And this these might be posts. Um, and we also had found, it's a little hard to see, I'll go back. You might not be able to see it from where you're at, but there's an oxidized orange patch through here. And so there's a hearth right in here too. Okay. So if we then turn back again, looking at the wall that's just below us right here, we found another thing that we think is a post. So we called this the dirt carrot for the longest time because it was very strange. We couldn't understand what this was. And it, it basically was a cylinder at the top, about four inches or 10 centimeters, and it went down to a point like an icicle. And this wall is awfully chewed up. We had a thunderstorm come through and water cascaded in and chewed things up. But I overlaid this drawing here to just show you there's a series of features here in this image and they all go together. Now, if we step back a little farther away from just the stratigraphy of walls and look at it all together, the walls I was just showing you before where the layers get kind of disturbed are right here. 1997, I dug a hole right there. And I think we may have dug right through the inside of a very big feature and didn't realize it because it was so large. So remember when I said, told the students, take the brown off of the gray? So this was the result. These are the pits I just had showed you, this fire hearth in a pit. But inside this area was a really deep area of dark sediment that was loaded with archaeological material. And there's a couple of them too. So, so what I'm going to show you now is a map of all the items we mapped in place associated with this dark sediment and all the different posts we think are posts. And it looks like this. 
So each of these little tiny dots is an artifact. And this represents 20 centimeters of distance in the site. It's all compressed together and all goes together spatially. So this is why it takes us 10 years to dig one of these because we have to be able to find all these items. We also find that inside the house were a whole bunch of broken hunting tools, um, projectile points, maybe knives, things like this. Outside was a big hearth, as I mentioned, that's loaded, these red polygon symbols are firecracked rock. And then someone's also bringing a bunch of firecracked rock inside this area. And I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, but um, so we got radiocarbon dates on mussel shell, freshwater mussel shell out of here, and it dates to close to 10,000 years. We also got a date on another hearth feature that I showed you earlier in the wall that was older on a piece of wood, but I think that could be an old piece of wood, maybe a piece of driftwood that had been in the system for a while. We should probably do more dating to really nail it down. But the point is, is that this reconstruction of just the artifacts and these shapes correlates, I think, very well with a drawing made by a geoarchaeologist named uh, Roald Frixell, who was at Washington State University. And he made this drawing for the archaeologist B. Robert Butler to reconstruct what they thought they had found at a site about less than a quarter mile away from Cooper's Ferry. And this place is called the Double House site. And the Double House site has um, one of these kinds of features that's reconstructed this way. So they didn't find the organic parts, they just found the base and some post holes and so on and items inside. But this one, as it's written here in the night, it's like 1963, I think this is written. It resembles the type built by the Nez Perce in historic times. And so sort of elongate mat lodge with rounded ends. So for me, I'm, I think that we're looking at the same thing. I think that's the archeological expression of the thing that the Nez Perce people already know that there's a village here and it's persisted for many, many thousands of years. And um, it also could be measured perhaps this way. So archeologists are really great at trying to brag about, oh, we found the first or the weirdest or the smallest or the biggest. And we can do a little bit of that, of course, here at the site. But I think obviously we have to always remember that that kind of stuff is not about me as the archeologist, it's about the people that the heritage is about. But I think what's interesting is this is the oldest evidence of a house. And this isn't published yet, by the way, so don't tell anybody. So, but this is the oldest evidence of a house in the lower 48. Um, and maybe, I know there are some earlier ones in Alaska. But I think what's amazing about that is not that like, wow, people made houses then. It's like, that's a ridiculous statement. Of course, people made houses. We just haven't been able to find evidence of it. So in this way, archaeology hasn't caught up to traditional perspectives sometimes. And we often have the opportunity to do that. And I think this is one of those cases. So for me, what's incredible is the time depth of continuity. I mean, this is a house style that's being made in the last few hundreds of years before European people show up. And yet we can also see it at about 10,000 years ago. And so sometimes archaeologists have expectations that things should change over time, but they don't have to. I mean, you find really great solutions to the place you live in, and sometimes that's the answer, is that continuity and tradition are the thing that keep you alive and keep you happy and keep you well-fed and so on. And there's maybe no reason why they should necessarily change. Now, there are other versions of houses, but this is one that I think is a long-lived pattern. Okay, so to kind of bring it back together then, what does the archaeology of Cooper's Ferry or Napaha tell us? And I think that we're looking at evidence of ancestral peoples of the Nez Perce. Uh, they lived at the site repeatedly from at least 16,000 years ago. And the presence of features containing tools, intensive food processing, seasonal animal remains, and large quantity of cultural materials, and houses, is consistent with a winter village lifeway, just as has explained in the story about the site. And so the archaeological record may show that village life at this site extends back into the end of the Ice Age, the 16,000 years ago. So characteristic aspects of what we call the Columbia River plateau cultural pattern, you might say. Then this is a pattern that's variations on a theme that you'll see all over the interior Northwest, 
These have roots that extend extremely deep into the past, into the late Pleistocene. And archaeological evidence of earlier Nemi Pu or Nez Perce peoples may be present elsewhere in the, at the site itself, and we just didn't measure it because we didn't excavate that part. Or it could be someplace else in the San Bernardino Canyon, extending the story much earlier than 16,000 years. I mean, I don't know. I can't say because we haven't necessarily looked. But I think what's magical about this is Nez Perce oral history and archaeological science tell very similar stories here. And that is something that I think that we should pay more attention to moving forward. So thank you very much. Okay, so we don't want any questions? Okay. Yes, and we don't have a microphone, so should I repeat the question for the online audience? Okay. Yeah, I will start here and we'll move around, so. Uh, do you have any idea what those 10 points, what game they, they were made for, what they were used for? So the question is, what kinds of animals did those stem points, were they used to hunt? Well, I mean, the purpose of these weapons, of course, is just to make the cardiovascular system fail. It, you shoot one into an animal, I think if, if an animal like a horse or a mammoth fell over right away, you might be suspicious. Like that's like, wait a minute, we're used to have to poke a bunch of holes in the animal to wear it down. And so it might take a little longer than what we have expectations for modern weaponry. So I think what I'm saying is that those tools could have been used likely to hunt any animal that as first people could come across. It's just how you do it. So even the very small ones, you know, I mean, it doesn't take a very large bullet to take down a big animal. You just have to place it correctly. Yes. You know that those points were stored. There's all the things. Were they stored there from the ground? Or would they get traded for preferred materials? So the question is whether the the stone tool material is from that area or from some other area, and how did it get there? Well, all those materials that we show are from within sometimes a hundred yards to a few miles away, not very far. We do have obsidian at the site, um, and I didn't mention this, but we have obsidian from the very bottom of the Lus layer, and uh, the obsidians come from like Timber Butte, which is in a little south of us in Idaho. But also we have what's called a vitrifere, which is another volcanic kind of rock, comes from the Locksaw River drainage. But we also, a little bit later on, we get obsidians from Oregon start to come in. And so the earliest evidence of obsidian that I know of in our region or even beyond comes from here. So, so people already know where this stuff is at 16,000 years ago. That's pretty wild. So that all obviously tells you that's a greater, I think, time depth. Yes. Um, concerning the Wolverine dog, which seems to have been put there sort of whole and maybe on purpose. I'm wondering if there's anything in the oral culture that might suggest that it was sort of a protective charm because if we're imagining that these groups of people live at the site for so, some season of the year and they're going somewhere else other seasons and they're leaving all their tools and whatnot behind, you would think that they're, you know, they're they're first of all burying them to protect them, you know, keep them there. But maybe the animal jaw has a symbol because wolverines are so fierce. Maybe it had a symbolic value as a sure. So the question is, is there a deeper meaning or an alternate meaning to the presence of wolverine and even maybe other animals um, at the site? So let me begin my answer by saying archaeology is argument, right? So it's not that we know exactly that's how it happened. I mean, I wasn't there. So, so what the way in which I go about sort of figuring these things out is I might do a lot of reading to see, well, what do other people in other places say? Or if I can, are there things written about what people have said in, you know, in the Nez Perce world or, you know, even a little bit beyond that? And there are some things in the literature you can look at from hunting uh, cultures in interior Alaska and Canada. And the reason I bring that up is that Wolverine is more common in these parts of the world. And wolverine is often described as a very, very important animal. It has power and so on. But um, there's also a basic concept of things like, um, you know, the animals aren't 
successfully taken because they're being tricked or being out, you know, outsmarted or something. It's that the animals have agreed to give themselves to you, perhaps. I don't want to go into parts of that I it's not part of my own culture so much, but but in conversations I've had with some of my partners at the Nispers tribe, they say, well, the ethos of respect for animals and proper treatment of animals, even in death, is not something that is inconsistent with Nispers, you know, worldview. And so that's a part we're going to learn more about you know, to talk about it and maybe use it as a mode for interpretation. Because if you want to be just a more straightforward sort of science view about it, it's like, well, there's no reason why you should ever leave a tool behind that could be used to exhaustion. You have to be an optimal, uh, economically minded person in the past, but that isn't clearly happening here. So there could be something special going on that Maybe the tools are being retired. I don't know. Maybe they were part of taking the animal. And so out of respect, they're left behind. This is the part that gets very difficult to know with certainty. But I think what I'm going to move forward, the way we're going to interpret this, is I might say, here are some perspectives that maybe I have, but I want to get voices from the tribe that come in and say, here are other perspectives too. And so we need to have what is sometimes referred to as a two-eyed approach. So we need to bring both of these or different people perspectives together and not you don't have to be so judgmental about one is the best and one's this because again we weren't there so let's just explore maybe the entire breadth of the concept of what it could have been that's a very long answer that'll should teach the rest of you uh, yes way in the back can you talk a little bit about the process of the collaboration with the tribe because you mentioned many times that this is all stuff already known to indigenous histories and indigenous culture and then as first community culture, like the, the horses and the dogs. And so I'm thinking like, why do we need archaeology for the business? Yeah, that's a good question. No, it's a very good question. But the thing about it though, is it ends up being um, sometimes about the, uh, when you have development, let's say that happens where you, you have to have a, someone there to represent the people in terms of our heritage is recorded in the ground. And if, if there are ways to avoid, uh, you know, affecting it or or we have to be able to identify what it is, you know, when we're talking about things like when is it a house or when is it something else, that knowledge comes from traditional perspectives, but the metrics of it in terms of what it actually looks like in a practical sense comes from archaeology too. Now, remember, you know, NISPRS have an, a cultural resource program, you know, so they do archaeology too in their own way, but um, what I would like to see us move toward is a version in where it's like an indigenous archaeology, where it's a for us, by us approach, where it's a much more of people being able to speak about what they want out of archaeology, you know, take it on and make it the thing that they want. And I can only be a person on the side to help with that, of course, um, but I'm happy to do it. But but the thing, though, is about it is it was talked about in the beginning, you know, time immemorial Time in memorial, remember, just means the time before memory. And so when we get to the time before memory, it means that you know, it's kind of hard to remember the details of exactly all the little things that happened. So, like, you know, it wasn't that people didn't have an knowledge that maybe horses had were part of stories, but to know that there's a horse in this excavation unit at this depth of the site, I mean, that's not something that was remembered necessarily. But I don't mean to trivialize it, it's just like, um, the things that archaeologists can provide in terms of knowledge about the past, but I think the interpretation side of it is important that we always have to remember that it's about somebody else. And in this case, you know, collaborating with an Esper's tribe is important to get to a part where they feel like they have a voice in describing their own past. And I admittedly, I don't know that I've done a great job about that as I've grown through my career, but I hope to get better at doing this. And, and a lot of that is a part of me just trying to work more earnestly with the tribe and you know let's have conversations and what do you want to get out of archaeology and sometimes you're surprised at the answers so yes how does this site compare time-wise to the rock shelter that's outside of the pot uh the so the question is how does this site uh compare to the rock shelter that's near by it's weiss rock shelter yeah. it's called uh, if I'm remembering correctly, the Weiss Rock Shelter has a record that goes to like six, seven thousand years, maybe. What's notable, though, about Weiss Rock Shelter is it contains um, the faunal remains of bison uh, at like 
I want to say 2,500 years or so, something like that. So bison have been in the country, you know, a very, very long time. Um, and uh, it doesn't it doesn't show us the same record, of course. What people are doing at that place is not the same as what they're doing over here. So, yes. Are you aware of any comparable old localities on the East Coast? I don't know of any comparable older as old houses in the East Coast. I don't know. I'm not aware of that. There's a question back here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. No, this one wasn't. I mean, other than in the 1930s, they cut a road that kind of chopped the side off a little bit. But largely it was more about research to expand our understanding of what the early record would look like so we might educate others too. To understand. Yeah, no, it wasn't it wasn't because of that. But yes, that is why sometimes. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Lauren, we have a we have a couple of questions online for you, Lauren. Okay. Could I read them to you? Maybe you can answer in the audience. I'll get the chat going here. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, parks and vehicles are cited from your investigation. Did you determine anything about the fires we had there? How they produced them? Anything that you're, you know, that's something that you could be working with? You mean, uh, so the question is about fire, like what could we learn about how they were starting fires? Is that what you mean? So for some of those features that have a lot of ashy sediment in the basin of a burned ground feature we call hearth, we uh, collected all the sediment. And so we're gonna actually work with specialists probably starting next year uh, that can do things like identify all the charcoal, identify all the burned seeds, identify all the burned plant remains to understand a little bit more of the details of what's happening. And then science allows us to unlock more answers to questions like that. Um, and the, the fact that there's a lot of fire cracked rock at the site shows there's an intensive emphasis on what's called hot rock cooking, which is a way to control heat over long periods of time or to use it in a more indirect way. You can boil water also with hot rocks, of course, and so the, and which is an important part of like bone grease processing. So I, that's one of my favorite ideas, but I don't know if it's exactly true. So I think we have time for about one more question uh, okay. from the audience and maybe that one in the chat there. Okay, I just wanted to ask why they would leave behind kits of tools that were not only broken, but also new. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to me that they would leave behind like so the question is why perhaps people left broken and complete items together. I guess we might ask if we were to take your site, your house where you live and compress it down and then dig it 10,000 years from now, what would we find? Would we find broken and complete items somewhere in the house? Probably. So, so I think that some of it is we read into these things a lot. I don't know if we need to or not, but it could be that if they're, we have broken and complete items together, then they're putting them in the ground, maybe for reasons beyond, like I maybe I'm not going to come back and use the broken ones, but you could. You could refashion that broken one into something else. Um, some of this is just very practical, too. And you got to remember... You know, humans, as a rule, are really fantastic survivalists. You know, we've been here for a really long time. And so being able to learn how to do things, even with fragments of items and make them useful later, maybe that's part of it. Or maybe it's some of the things that are harder for us to measure, which is more special, you know, so philosophical approaches to what the tool represents and what its function was at that point in its life history. So but I don't know exactly the answer. All I can do is talk about it from these different perspectives, I think, but thank you. All right, so there's some online questions. Yeah, I think we can do that one there. Um, so, okay. Yeah. All right, the question is, what is the current understanding for the age of occupation of Monte Verde in Chile in South America? Assuming it's still much older than 16,000, would that suggest a target geological age 
and deposits that we will target future excavations in Idaho. So, so the Monte Verde site has two parts of it. One, Monte Verde II is the one we hear about most of the time. In the, the earliest ages, as far as I understand, are about 14,400, 14,200 at that Monte Verde II. Monte Verde I is a little bit away up the stream basin and it gets into the 20,000s, but it has not been widely accepted by a lot of people. Some people think that they're not necessarily looking at artifacts or, or disagree with maybe something else. But, um, you know, I used to really kind of get wound up in thinking about the whole issue of what's the earliest, what's this and what's that, and how does my work fit into this? And as I do more of this, I realize that's really not the most important thing, perhaps. It's for me to maybe do a good job of understanding the thing that's in front of me, that is the heritage of the people that live there. And, but I won't be surprised if we do find things that are older, let's just say that, you know. And I think having an open mind is important. I don't have some magic number, it has to be but I also have high expectations for quality of data. So I need the argument to be done really well for me to accept it. So, so that's why we spent a lot of time and effort on our work, because we figured if we were gonna destroy part of the site, we wanted to do our best to put the best argument forward to interpret what was here. That was like our obligation to do that work. So anyway, I'm sorry, George, I don't know if I've answered your question well, but you can find me on the internet and write me an email if you like. So, <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, so we're going to do our kind of annual thing, we or monthly thing. We do a raffle, raffle for books, and we do a raffle for a student year-long membership. And I don't even have to have Lauren pull out the student because there was just one ticket for a student, so they are a lucky winner. Um, so that would be um, eight six six one seven eight. Hey. All right. So if you can, uh, well done. <laughs> so. Um, You'll get a year-long membership. So afterwards, if you can give me your name and like an email address, I'll write you to get that details from you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so then for the books, we have a selection of two books here. Um, we have the Spokane River, which was published a few years ago by area scholars on the importance of the Spokane River. And we have excavations at uh, Gibbons Hot Springs, uh, middle late archaic pit house settlement in Southwest Idaho. So I will this. You get to pick and oh. read, actually. We always let our speakers do that. So okay. first one. First one is six seven zero six seven seven five. Bingo. All right. Okay. And second one here. Six seven zero six seven eight five. Oh, that's a seven eight five. All right. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Lauren, and other. Thank you. And, uh, we hope to see you all back in January and have a great holiday season, everyone. Yes. Okay.